The Hornets get the win against Atlanta. Now the question is, how sustainable is some of their play? Plus, the Lakers are interested in a star on this team. We'll talk about all that today on the Locked On Hornets podcast. We're Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. In a minute, cuz we live. We live. We It's Locked On Hornets, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. It's your team every day. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your podcast. Thanks for checking us out anywhere you get them, but also you can get it on YouTube too, so you can watch us as we do this show. There's Doug Branson. I did the solo show just yesterday. He is back. You can see in the bullet point rundown that he will give you the fire takes. Doug take plus fire emoji always seems a little too dangerous for radio, but they are not too dangerous for the pod. This is where his environment is we'll also get to how sustainable some of this stuff is but uh, we got a lead with the report from sham sharania of the athletic who wrote a part of his laker write-up that charlotte's terry rogier emerged as a trade target for the lakers in the offseason and their interest in him remains high this is a lakers team that has gotten off to what is an awful start we had Russell Westbrook decided that he, he he decided that he wanted to go for a two for one opportunity at the end of the game when they had the lead. And you didn't really need to do that and take that bad shot. He also is somebody that has posted some pretty awful shooting displays so far. LeBron James, three games into the season, is wanting to not fall for the trap that uh, disparages Russell Westbrook, even though he was just asked a simple question about the decision Russell Westbrook made at the end of that game. So I would imagine Russell Westbrook is coming back to Charlotte in any Terry Rozier trade scenario. You have the two first round picks at the Lakers own. Could you squeeze them for both of them if they valued Gordon Hayward and Terry enough? There's a lot to get to. What's something that you want to point to with this Terry Rozier rumor? Well, a couple of things. I want to go back to your cold open, number one, where you said the word star, Quote, teasing unquote. Terry Rozier, but you said it like star? You said it with a mm-hmm. question mark. I need you to say that with an exclamation point because Terry Rozier is an absolute star for this oh. team. Now, he may not be an NBA star. A he flies no, no. under the radar. That's My fine. Nobody wants to talk only- about him. <laughs> you know, he's got the Charlotte Hornets label on him. That's fine. But Terry Rozier is a certified gamer, and he's a certified mm-hmm. star for this team. And uh, they, they need him back as quickly as possible. So that's number one. Number two, the Lakers' interest can remain high. And I hope that the, the reason the deal didn't get done in the summer is because the Charlotte Hornets' price remained high for Terry Rozier. And, and really, like I think Terry Rozier is an asset, but that's not why the price should stay high, Walker. It's because the Charlotte Hornets are in the catbird seat. They're 2-1, and one, and they don't have LaMelo. They don't have Terry. They're winning games right now. Guess what the Lakers are not doing? They're not winning games. They're the ones that they have no leverage. The Hornets have all the leverage in this situation. I think if you're going to move Terry, you, you must, must bring back both of those first-round picks. Because if you move Terry, that's got to be step one in, in, a, in a sort of larger teardown. I don't think you can move Terry and bring in Russ and play Russ, certainly, but even waive Russ, and, and then expect to keep on this trajectory. I think you've got to have all the bodies in order to make this, if they, if they want to make this run for the sixth seed or higher or get the playoff spot, then they've got to have everybody on deck. And so, you know, if you're going to move Terry, that's got to be part of a larger rebuild. you got to get both of those first-round picks because the Lakers have no leverage in this situation. Yeah, and you look at their 2023 first-round draft pick, the Pelicans have the right to swap picks. So they have what they get to take the Lakers' first-round pick there. The 2024 NBA draft pick, that's owned by the Pelicans and have the rights to receive 2025 pick instead. Um, so you're talking about a couple of first round picks that are going to be later for the Hornets, right? Like it is not going to be immediately satisfying with whatever you get back in turn for Terry Rogier and Gordon Hayward. And that might matter. The rebuild might need to be a little more expedited if the Hornets decide to take that route, which they've won a couple of games, right? We don't need to make some sweeping statement based off a three game record, but they've won a couple of games. They're two and one so far. If they do decide to take that route, then you would not get any 
instant gratification based off of getting these trade or getting these first round picks. And it might need to be expedited more so for the Hornets because you're trying to keep LaMelo ball happy, right? Like, and so you, if you are going to take the rebuild route and you want to put a star as quick as possible right next to him, then you would need to get a guy in place right away. That looks like he could be a stud going forward. So yeah, especially if the Lakers are a little hesitant to trade two first round picks for miles Turner and buddy healed, then do you think they're going to do that for just Terry for Terry and Gordon? Like I, that's the thing. So the, that's it, to me, it's going to be really hard to try to figure out a trade and, unless you're the Hornets and you're just like, that's fine. We'll take the first rounders and we'll move and we'll buy out Russell Westbrook and we'll just take the, the first round picks for the future. Well, Walker, right? I just don't see that happening though. Well, they were wait. They weren't ready to do it in the summer. And mm-hmm. now we've seen three games of Russell Westbrook, and it hasn't looked very good at all. And you just got to let that thing simmer. I mean, because at, at some point you're seeing the frustration play itself out on the court right now, and, and it's visible from both a- Anthony Davis and LeBron James. And so eventually, listen, this is LeBron's mess, by the way. Ru- Russell Westbrook is LeBron's mess, and so the onus is going to be on him to clean it up, to go to management and say, do whatever it takes because we can't take this anymore. Terry Rozier would be a, a huge asset to our team because he, he is the one thing that they need, which is outside shooting. Uh, Gordon Hayward would help them in, in that respect as well. Uh, but Terry Rozier is a perfect fit for that team. Uh, but I hope, again, if the Hornets do it, and, and I don't think they, they don't have to do it right now because they're winning ball games. The Hornets don't have to do it. And, but if they do it, I hope they get the highest possible price because, because, Walker, we mm-hmm. just can't, let LeBron James keep getting away with this. Every time LeBron James gets backed into a corner, when he when Le GM backs himself into a corner, what does the NBA come along and do? Some team bails him out, gives him Anthony you Davis, and you and gets nothing in return that they can really use to rebuild their franchise. So I, you know, we cannot let LeBron James keep. You mean getting the Pelicans away with this. don't get anything in return to rebuild their and franchise? What have they won? How, what have they won? They barely beat the Hornets. Give me a break. Zion's hurt now. It seems like Brandon Ingram. Pelicans. Brandon Ingram's hurt too. I mean, come on, <laughs> Pelicans. What have they won? How many? How many? How many championships have they won? Uh, yeah, <laughs> the answer is zero. Why do you? Why do you take so long to answer these questions that I give you? The answer is obviously zero. They've won zero championships because teams keep letting LeBron mm-hmm. James get away with this by delivering him exactly what he wants on yeah. a platter, on a silver platter, and they get nothing in return, or they get a little in return. The Hornets have to get the maximum amount in return if they're going to do this deal. Okay, um, those those two first round picks for the Lakers. Come back, baby. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> You really are. You brought the fire very quickly. Coming up next on the Locked On Hornets podcast. We're going to get to some of those Doug takes. but That's a little, I don't know. Everybody's sleepy. It was a little late. Yeah. um, You have made your way back to Nashville from Charlotte. It was great seeing you. Uh, It was really really good seeing you. And now here we are back to the old (laughs) fiery take Doug. Um, We're going to talk about how sustainable some of the good stuff is from the Hornets. We'll also get to Doug's takes, as you can see. This day and age, everybody with their new potential hires can feel like high stakes wager for your small business when you're looking for those new hires. You want to be 100% certain that you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn Jobs. LinkedIn jobs helps you find the right people for your team you can find them faster and you can fire uh, hire you know, don't fire them hire them instead when you go to linkedin you can hire them for free too you can talk about how easy it is to create this free job post on linkedin you can also talk to talk about how easy it is to add the frame but you also have simple tools like screening questions you can make it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experience so you can find and quickly prioritize who you'd like to interview and higher LinkedIn jobs helps you find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster. You can post your job for free at linkedin.com slash locked on NBA. That's linkedin.com slash locked on NBA to post your job for free terms and conditions apply. What's sustainable for this Hornets team. We'll talk about that next on the locked on Hornets podcast is locked on Hornets. This says the Hornets received three votes for their handling of James Borrego, who was viewed as doing a good job the past couple of years before Charlotte fired like him, him man. after the season. Then hire him. No one's hired him. These GMs are like, oh, we love James Borrego. Are you, you going to hire him? Ah, I don't yeah. think so. He got blown out twice <laughs> and played. You can't hire that guy. 
It's time for more of the Locked on Hornets podcast. Thanks for making Locked On Hornets your first listen today. Make your second listen game to game NBA. Every moment, every top performance, every result, Locked On Game to Game covers every game across the NBA with local analysis that only Locked On can deliver. Follow Game to Game on Locked On NBA, available on the Odyssey app, YouTube, and wherever you get your podcasts. Yeah, one more thing. Yeah, one more thing on this Russell Westbrook thing. Okay. If the Hornets do get multiple first round picks in in any kind of deal that brings back Russell Westbrook, I would only ask one thing. I think it's a very simple thing to ask, but I think I have to I have to be explicit about it. I would like the Charlotte Hornets to use all of those draft picks because I'm sitting here, I'm watching Jalen Duran uh play well for the Detroit Pistons, look like a factor on that team. And uh, meanwhile, uh, you know, Mark Williams, who I think is going to, going to be a good player. We're going to have to be patient, a lot like we were patient. Well, we weren't very patient with Nick Richards, but the organization was patient with Nick <laughs> yeah, Richards. They were, I guess. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Mark, well, you know, Mark Williams is going to be fine. But Jalen Duran, I'm just, I'm, I'm, I'm subjected to his greatness, it feels like. Uh, and, and the Hornets could have had him. So all I ask is that if you're going to trade for multiple first-round picks, please actually use them. Yeah, so is he going to become your Shea Gilgis Alexander, even though, hell, I mean, we both we both did the darkest episode ever of Locked on Hornets, and quite literally the darkest episode ever because your lights weren't working <laughs> when we did the draft recap, and we wanted Jalen Duran. Oh, poor Mark, because I like Mark as a prospect. I like him, but Jalen, we wanted him, and now he's doing some really nice things with Detroit. But, Doug, who needs any center coming from this past draft when you have Nick Richards putting career highs up? That's That's right. Only player in the NBA, I think, to have two double-doubles off the bench this season. 20 points, a career high that he scored against Atlanta. 11 rebounds, also a career high that he recorded against Atlanta. Five offensive boards. It's eight in the first game against Spur- against San Antonio, and then he had five against Atlanta. So hitting the offensive glass hard. Nick Richards. Is his play maybe not the career highs that he's recording, you know, one every other game, right? But is this largely sustainable where he gets, I'll throw a stat line of 11 and 7. Is that sustainable for Nick Richards and whatever is in the realm of possibility that we would consider good? I wouldn't have said so until right at this moment, but I, I think absolutely. And, and I do think that eventually he will start at center for the Charlotte Hornets. There are some things that are making it uh, a little bit more difficult to start him, and it really has nothing to do with Nick Richards, and it's a lot of what they're what they, what the team is missing and, and what Nick Richards can deliver. Because Nick has been great at interior scoring. He's been a beast on the offensive boards. Uh, but but the one thing uh, that he doesn't do a ton of is facilitate. Mason Plumley can help you there. He can hurt you in a few places, but he can help you with facilitation. We saw we saw Mason hit so many of those cutters uh, against Atlanta, helping helping that offense, especially that starting offense, flow a little bit better. Uh, Nick Richards, I think his he has the potential to evolve that part of his game, uh, but right now everything else has been dominant. And I, I think when you get Lamelo back, when you get Terry back, there's going to be an even greater argument to put him in to the starting role. But he's already getting more minutes than Mason because I think some of the things that he does across the game work with both the starting unit and the uh, and the bench unit. The other thing I'll say is that he did have one pass in that Atlanta game, and it was for that for the Kevin Love of the game base ball pass that he had I love that I mean I well let's see more of that highlight play I'm just telling you Lamelo's sitting on the bench right now Walker and he's going num 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 because Kevin Love is I mean Kevin Love Nick Richards got Kevin Love on the brain Nick Richards is doing so many things that are going to help uh Lamelo ball be even more Lamelo ball okay what was that noise that he was doing on the sideline num 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 He's just he's just waiting. He's just waiting to get back in there and throw lobs to Nick Richards and Nick Richards throw. You know, again, it's 
when I say like passing, you know, Mason Plumley is doing these a little bit more. I, I, strange, strange to say, but I think it's a little bit higher level of difficulty passing when you're talking about passing at the free throw line, hitting cutters, the precision that that takes a little bit more. I think difficult than doing the baseball pass where you're just, you know, you're you're just throwing it over the defense and and trying to hit the guy in stride. He has been good at bounce passes to cutters from the from the high post. He's been very good at Plumley or He's, Richards. No, Plumley. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Plum, Plumley has been very good at that and you mentioned the passing without Lamelo ball that's a point that i made in the solo act yesterday five assists for gordon hayward six for mason six for dsj three for mcdaniels four for teo maladon you had a couple with book night that was the last one to get multiple but the point being is they accumulated 28 assists and that was right on par with their average last year when the hornets averaged the most assists per game of any team in the nba so the fact that you're doing that without LaMelo, the fact that you're doing that without James Borrego too, like I think there are some signs here with the Hornets getting out in transition as well, having some awesome, beautiful half-court possessions, Doug, which maybe that's something we need to focus on a more. Like, is that something that's sustainable? Even without LaMelo, I thought we saw the ball move very well. And they had some excellent possessions that were like, what, what is this team? Like you have Gordon Hayward attacking. So one possession I think that I want to go to is Kelly Oubre drives in the paint. He doesn't go helter skelter and just shoots it, you know, immediately upon getting there, he kicks it out. Mm -hmm. And then I think it goes around the horn. Gordon Hayward attacks. Maybe it kicks out again. In the end, Nick Richards, I believe ends with the, with a dunk. I might've mixed a couple possessions, but I know that there was one where with that started with Kelly. I just found a couple of those possessions for the Hornets to be very nice and well executed in the half court. And that's something that looks pretty good. I don't know how sustainable it is. All I know is that they've been able to put some points on the board so far. And Steve Clifford did not want to tinker with the offense all that much. No, it's interesting. You know, in that Atlanta game, they actually didn't push the pace as mm -hmm. much as they had in the previous two games, especially off live rebounds. Uh, they it was it was actually a pretty low number, the frequency for that, according to clean the glass so a lot of their work was done in the half court but the important part is yes they were moving the basketball but the most important part in that Atlanta game was that they were moving their bodies into the paint everybody was cutting everybody was when they had the basketball in their hands they were looking to get in the paint and then either move it out or move it to a cutter uh, so is that sustainable you know, I think you're going to have certain games where uh, that's necessary and, and they can execute on it if that's the game plan. But I think generally you're probably going to see this team run and try to try to make chaos more so uh, than, than, you know, be sort of a Spursian half court masterful ball movement team o over the course of the 82 game season. Hawks also were uh, just atrocious at defense last year. Mm -hmm. Now they opened up with the Rockets and the Magic this season. Atlanta got a couple wins, um, but they allowed 126. And I thought it was really well played by Charlotte. That's one thing, too. You know, I, I we're kind of getting away from the sustainable stuff. I wanted to talk about DSJ. Maybe we can go into the third segment as well. But I did want to make a point to how the Hornets are responding to Steve Clifford. You know, it's a point we made after the Pelicans game. Clifford was not happy and pleased like the rest of my Hornets Twitter timeline was, despite the loss to the Pelicans. He, he in fact, was not okay with the way they lost. Unforced turnovers, defending and fouling while defending. How about this? You look at the way they played against the Atlanta Hawks. Nick Richards had one foul. He had only one, and that was when somebody was driving across him. He reaches down. He shouldn't have done it, but the fact that you only get one foul out of Nick Richards in 20 minutes, you got to love seeing that. And after, I think it was, was it 37 uh, free throw attempts for the Pelicans? Um, you know, hell, I mean, Atlanta still had 35. I just was more <laughs> impressed with Nick Richards, you know, like only Nick Richards, the fact that he well, didn't Well, you know, contribute. one thing at a time, you know, you, know you, right. you, can't, you can't fix it all in one night. Nick Richards getting one is the thing that was impressive, though, like because he's always one that contributes if he's going to play a lot of minutes. And the fact that he, you know, he had the swiping one, but still, um, yeah, love to see that. All right. Let's continue this conversation a little more into the third segment. Plus, coming up next on the Lockdown Hornets podcast. Don't go to sleep on the Hornets just yet. We're going to get some fiery Doug takes because I went solo. I do want to hear some of his rapid fire bullet points that he noticed from this game against Atlanta as well. That's still to come on Locked on Hornets. Is Locked on Hornets. 
I'm glad we have YouTube now for everybody to see just how bulk you are. Can you give us a gun show flash real quick? Oh, yeah. Me and you, man. Look at that drape. Look at that. That's 100% grade A. Look, here I am arms. doing it. I, look at these noodle arms right here. Look, they just flow. Yeah, we got it. Listen. Yeah. listen. Yep. Yeah. Just you want long, chicken wings? Skinny arms. Yeah, if you're if you've been starving for some chicken wings, this is the show for you, folks. <laughs> YouTube.com yeah. I mean, forward slash chicken wings. It's time for more of the Locked On Hornets podcast. That might be my favorite, Bob. Locked On. <laughs> Whatever the handle is, slash chicken wing. Find us. That's the URL to find us here. Um, man, one thing else, I, the other sustainable question I had for you is DSJ. <laughs> How about 34 minutes? It was the most time that any Hornet logged in this game against Atlanta. He went 8 of 16 from the field, had 18 points, and dished out six assists. Defensively, I thought was good as well. Dennis was also pretty impressive in the first two games. Man, are we just going to expect to see this? The, the three-point shooting, I think it's safe to say we are not going to see that going forward. But everything else, Doug, like those are those are things that Dennis Smith, I think, can bring to the floor. I, I, I'm in. I, I'm so happy to see him performing as well as he has against the Spurs, the Pelicans, and now the Hawks. So I'll give you some numbers. Right now, Dennis Smith Jr.'s points per shot attempts, according to Cleaning the Glass, is 133. Now, they don't have where that would rank him good. Uh, among point guards yet because the sample size is too small across the league. They don't have the uh, those numbers out yet, but I would I would venture to say that's going to be in the, in the top echelon among point guards, and uh, it, rep- it would represent by far his best points per shot attempt across his career. It never went higher uh, his second year in Dallas when he only played 32 games. It was 105. That's as high as it's ever been. It's, it's really hung around the 90s or even sometimes the 80s uh, throughout his career. So offense has not been where he has made his hay. I mean, it's all a bit been about his defense. And, you know, turning defense into offense, that's what we saw from DSJ. You know Clifford loves that. Sealing the basketball, even when he makes a mistake like he did in, in, uh, against New Orleans, he made that mistake through a bad pass, got back on the other end, and took it from C.J. McCollum. Just took it, said, give me it, and took it back and got the layup. Got the score, defense to offense. I don't think 133 is sustainable. The three-point shot, certainly not at the rate that he's doing it now, but right. I don't think we can totally count out the possibility that he's he's had a lot of time to work on his game because he hasn't been playing a lot. You know, I mean, he hasn't played uh, more than 40 games since his rookie year. So, you know, he's had a lot of time to figure some stuff out uh, as he works his way back in the league. So I'm not going to count out that he's figured something out with his jump shot all of a sudden. I just don't think it's going to be at that level. Is D- DSJ sustainable. It's all going to be about health, though. You know, how many games can he play? Can I read you some fun DSJ three game sample size stats that we've oh, had? I love from him? small sample size theater. Uh, it's fantastic. It. So I'll go to first Dennis Smith Jr.'s Twitter account himself. He retweeted a stat from nice. Dalton Trigg, and it was of the top players according to defensive rating in the NBA. Do you know where Dennis Smith Jr. ranks? I'm going to say top five. He's number one. Oh, ho, 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 ho. That 81. Deserves, the, deserves so, a fanfare. There, yeah, the, it does deserve the fanfare. There you go. So, you know, defensive rating, not a great indicator on how good you are defensively, but 81.7. Obi Toppin, big time surprise there, by the way, known as an, an atrocious defender coming out of college. Obi Toppin, 85.1. Justice Winslow, Cam Reddish, Javon Carter. So then you're getting down the list there. Dennis Smith, number one, according and, to the defensive rating stat. And Walker, I mean, in Steve Clifford's time in Charlotte, you know, how many A plus defenders did he really have? I mean, that, you know, MKG, I mean, you can count them on, on one hand. I mean, he did, he, he was great at getting sort of, uh, his calling card is getting players to ri- you know, rise to mediocre level defense. And if you get all of the guys buying in on that, then you can have a pretty good defense. If you can get everybody playing you know, mid to above average defense, then it's great. You don't need like one or two shut down guys. But he just hasn't had that. He hasn't had that. And boy, does he have it. And, and Dennis Smith Jr., on ball pressure. Like, I, I don't know that I've seen many. The Hornets or Bobcats in this kind of modern era be able to apply the pressure that DSJ has in these three games. It's been incredible to watch. 
Can I read you Andy Bailey's way too early <laughs> box plus minus leaders? Sure. I just need some permission. Thank you. I will read to them then. Dennis Smith Jr. is 10th in the league among <laughs> box plus minus leaders Ooh. at 7.2. Do you want to know the names that are above him? Give it's them to me. Giannis, Luca, Christian Wood, wow. Wow. Nikola Jokic, Devin oh Booker, John ja Morant, LeBron Devin James, Booker. Tyrese Halliburton, and Steph Curry, Brandon Ingram's the last one. Right. Crunch, recrunch those numbers. I don't know why Devin so, Booker's hanging around there. Oh, uh, of course. But Devin, but Dennis Smith Jr. being in that list, that seems to be the thing that does not belong. And yet here he is with your first and second team all NBA list. <laughs> I mean, that's what it seems like. I what what he's done, it's 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 kind of crazy. Because yeah. the, you're talking about a very early start to a journeyman's career. The fact that you had that happen so quickly for him, and he's been very good. Um, the, the fact that he's putting up these types of numbers, the last thing I'll say, and I can't find it here, but you know, NBA math, Dan Favalli, Adam Frommel, a part of the NBA math, Bleacher Report family, they have the total yeah. points added. And I, I know you don't, you might not want to put a ton of merit in total points added, defensive rating. I'm, I'm just, you do what you want with the numbers, right? That's what numbers are there for. You can do whatever you want with them. But in total points added, Dennis Smith Jr. hasn't played a ton of minutes, right? He, he had not coming into this game against Atlanta. But in the two games that he played, he was actually one of the more impactful players, according to TPA, despite him not having played a ton of minutes. It's kind of crazy what he's doing right now in a very small sample size. I'll give you a number. A1. That's a letter mm -hmm. and a number. You get the letter. That's a bonus. Bo bonus. A1 is what Steve Clifford called Dennis Smith Jr., an A1 competitor. I don't know what that means. Oh, but, I like it, though. Yeah, But it right. sounds great. great point. Right? Like, great I point. don't know exactly what he's talking about, A1 competitor, but it sounds amazing. And uh, Dennis Smith Jr. has been that. And I'll tell you what. It's leak. I think it's leaking into other players that might be raising their game. Watching what Dennis Smith Jr. This is what happened with MKG when he would go to the floor for loose balls. When he would lock players down, Marvin Williams, another person that would just give it everything they had out there, and it seemed like other players fed off of that throughout the game. And I think that's what you're seeing with DSJ. And oh, by the way, Walker, we haven't even seen DSJ play with Lamelo all that much. Talk about that's that's where it gets interesting, right? Lamelo plus bench. Now it's LaMelo plus an A1 competitor defender right next to him. I mean, talk about causing problems for the other team. That's crazy. I have not seen any stats that indicate anybody else is in the A1 neighborhood. I think that's <laughs> just DSJ, but I will take it from Dennis Smith Jr. here with Charlotte. Last thing, if you want to talk, look, just going back to Steve Clifford one more time, kind of looking at the box score, you know, it, it goes to show just how well this team has responded to Steve Clifford and here's the crazy part about this start for the Hornets so far. I'm not even, look, the injuries that they suffered and to still win in a blowout against the Hawks, that's surprising, okay? Like, given all the injuries, no doubt about it, I did not expect that. But at the beginning of the season, when people were asking, where can the Hornets get their wins? It was clearly against San Antonio and Atlanta trying to figure out the whole DeJounte Murray, Trey Young experiment, you want to catch them early in that because they still have some things to figure out from two ball-dominant guards. So I'm not surprised, crazy surprised, to see the Hornets are 2-1, and one, although I'm very happy about it. What is interesting is, Doug, this preseason, you said it against San Antonio, this was not a good preseason for Charlotte. This was not one where it's like, okay, that's a team that has bought all in to the Steve Clifford way. This is not a guy in Nick Richards who performed extremely well all preseason or even summer league. It took really like the last two games or so from Nick Richards to show us something. You know, we didn't really see Dennis Smith Jr. at all. Um, I mean, th the fact that you're seeing the guys respond at this level where, you know, your boy JT Thor turns it over bad to I know we'll get to the more Thor thing. But JT Thor turns it over. What does he do? Sprints all the way back and swats one off the backboard. Jalen McDaniels, you know, playing well right now, but still hustling and running the floor just kind of like he always has. But Kelly Oubre is changing his game a little bit. Just you, you love to see it, man. You, you love seeing the team play hard. And I think you can go to the preseason and point out, yeah, this is a team actually in some cases didn't play hard at all. Well, it, here's what we're seeing. And we saw this even though they went 0-5 in the preseason. You're seeing progress and process. 
you're seeing it and, and we don't get to you know peek behind the curtain and see what's going on behind the scenes but obviously something happened in that week between the final preseason game and the first game of the regular season there is a process happening right now and and I think because that process is being clearly communicated to these players probably in a way that it hasn't been before or since they've been a member of this organization uh, they are they are responding to it and, and I'll tell you something else it's about clear communication it's about expectations it's about accountability knowing if you don't meet those expectations you will hear about it but it's also about trust how many times have we seen uh, Steve Clifford in these three games go to some kind of junk defense uh, you know some kind of zone situation to try to stop the other team how many times have we seen that um a lot zero no he didn't oh, you're saying he, James. No, no, I'm saying oh, Steve, Steve Clifford. I thought you were yeah. asking how many times have we seen James Brago do that. I'm sorry. Well, you're you're not listening, and you know I that's wasn't. that's I, that's I heard really James Brago it's hurtful. Do that. Honestly, I, you know I understand. I didn't. I wasn't on the last show. I get it. I abandoned you. I abandoned my boy. Yeah. Uh, but you know, to to not listen to me is is hurtful. But the answer yeah, is, I said, I said the exact opposite of what you're looking for. <laughs> the answer, the answer is zero. We haven't seen Steve Clifford really go to those junk defenses like James Borrego did. And I think what that communicates to the team is. I know you can do this. I trust you. And even if you fail, this is part of an 82-game process where by the end of the year, and Clifford preaches this all the time, is that the really good teams, no matter how good you are, if you're Warriors elite or you are Charlotte Hornets fringe play-in trying to get a playoff spot, it doesn't matter what kind of team you are. The good teams, the teams that, that can present a problem in the playoffs, they get significantly better from game z- game one to game 82. And so what we're seeing is a process unfolding. And the exciting thing is that he is he hasn't even had his full deck to play with yet. He might get closer to that against New York. And we'll talk about that coming up tomorrow. There you go. That was an excellent tease and with a lot more energy than I was going to provide. I was going to bring I was bringing up the rundown and that's why I answered your question the exact opposite way that you wanted to hear the answer. So I apologize. <laughs> but we're going to be better tomorrow. We're going to have a fantastic show. Make I don't know. Sure don't probably, don't say that. Don't probably, you know, it's no, all about no, under promise. If I've learned anything in this business, it's all about under promising. It's true. And also under delivering. But then occasionally over delivering to the point where people make you forget about all the times you under delivered. Yep. It's kind of uh, like Mason I'm, Plumley's passing. It's making I'm me forget about the left handed jump shot. What were I'm you saying? It, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. <laughs> it's locked on Hornets. Thanks for making us your first listen. We're free and available anywhere you get your pods. Make Locked On NBA your second listen. Locked On NBA, your daily 30 minute update on everything taking place within the association. Have a great rest of your day. We'll be back with you tomorrow.